Amen. Well, let's just pray. Father, we just thank you for today. Um, we can gather together as a, as a church family and just uh, fellowship with one another, but more importantly, fellowship with you. And uh, we thank you for your Holy Spirit uh, who is in us. And uh, um, that's why you never leave us or forsake us, because you're, you're in us through your Spirit. And we're so thankful for that. And we're thankful for today. And I'm thankful for this word. And uh, we just uh, offer this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, I always hesitate to call them things series, but there is going to be a series of messages. I don't know how many, but on, uh, on, on kingdom finance. Um, but before I get into that, I want to, I want to kind of give a personal, personal testimony and make my parents feel really uncomfortable. I'm, uh, I'm thankful that I grew up in a generous home. Um, I think generosity is such a godly trait, but I think generosity is one of those things that, that is best caught or, uh, you know, assimilated. And I've recognized that, that growing up in a home like that has caused me and my family to be generous because I saw that, because I saw that, that modeled. Um, they were generous with, with family and friends and finances. And I, I remember when I was younger, and I don't know how long Nancy lived with us, Nancy Shaw, but um, Nancy was, was down on her luck and she needed family. And, and uh, my parents offered her a room in our home and she came to, to live with us. And, and I think because of that, because that was modeled, not only have have we been generous as, as, a, as a family from a financial standpoint? We've also been generous with our, with our home, and we had someone, we've had, you know, other people live with us, and, and I know that that's, that's the case with my brother. And, and that's because this, this, this generosity, this spirit of generosity was modeled, and it was because God was in them. And they were so thankful for what God did in their life and uh, in, in what God had given them that they, they just exuded generosity. And if you know my parents and you know anything about them, you know that they're incredibly generous people. And I'm, I'm, appreciate, I'm appreciative of, of that model. And specifically in, in the area of, of finance, I, I can never recall a time where, and this, doesn't, this isn't going to rob my dad of a blessing, I can never recall a time where a ministry came into this place or he was someplace else where he didn't give. He was, he was just always giving. And I know that he doesn't feel real comfortable me talking about this, but I want to tell you that um, when we do things like this, when we're God-like and we, and we display God's character, people notice and people watch and they, and, and, and they catch it. And, I'm, and I want to say thank you, Mom and Dad, for modeling that for me because it's, it's um, generosity is one of those, amen. <laughs> generosity is, is, is one of those, those godly characteristics that, that we kind of have to work in our lives. And if we don't have that modeled and we're, we're around, um, whatever, around selfishness, um, uh, poverty, what, whatever, we, we, we tend to, that, that tends to get on us. And I'm not saying that when God comes into our life, I mean, he can change, he can change all that, but I'm just... I'm thankful that I grew up in a home like that, and and if and if you didn't have hope, you know you serve a you serve a generous generous God, and, and God wants you to 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 assimilate that character in Him, and and if you're open to that, and you're open to His correction, and you're open to His leading, then you could become generous also, and there are benefits to becoming to becoming generous, and I'm I'm going to share some of those benefits over the over the next few weeks, but. Um, you know this this idea that that you never have enough. That's that's a world's that's that's a worldly perspective. It's a carnal perspective. When you're in God's family, there's there's abundance, and and my my desire as a pastor is that that the people that the Lord sends to this place would sense and feel and live in that abundance, and and I'm not just talking about about finances, even though that's where this message is going. I'm talking about abundance in every way. God wants us to have a prosperous soul. He wants to, us to live in prosperity and in, in thought and in life. Um, he wants us to be, to be generous because he's generous with us. 
And, and I see, not just out in the world, so much restriction and, and so much lack. And it's not godly. It's not godly. And this is why um, the Bible talks a lot about finances. There's, there's, something, there's something about money or the lack of it that seems to control men, control women. And the scripture identifies what that is. It's, finances is, is one of these things that I, I believe that if, if, we, if we can get a hold of this, how to, how to make it, how to use it wisely, how to steward it properly, it releases something in us. Um, it, it takes restriction off of our life. It, it opens up our mind to, to vision and possibility. And, and I'm, I'm, aspects of this the world, the world can have. But what I'm talking about is, is how to steward finances from a godly perspective, a, a kingdom perspective. So the Bible, um, depending on the sources, mentions money about 800 times in the Old and New Testament. 11 of Jesus' parables of 39 parables is about money. You know, so Jesus talked a lot about money. I think it, it was the second most talked about subject by, by Jesus was, was money. So he, he realized that there was something in money or on money that could positively or negatively control people. Um, another reason why this, these series of messages is important is because debt is portrayed as a negative thing in Scripture. And... Um, Again, depending on the sources, the average American debt, the average individual is $38,000 in debt, excluding their home mortgage. $38,000 in debt. We have a debt-ridden culture. It's, it's, it's almost like, and I get it, there's good debt, there's bad debt, but, but generally speaking, debt is not good, and debt is bad. Debt really, you're, in, you're enslaved to the lender, when you're in debt, and I believe, I believe ideally God does not want, to, want us to be in debt. Somebody ha- some people have that deep conviction of debt that they don't even have home mortgages because, because they set out, I'm going to eradicate this debt so I can be freed up for kingdom, for kingdom purposes. I, I pray that that's, that that's all of our conviction. That's, that's, that's my conviction. Um, because of the lack of money, it makes people poor. Interestingly enough, again, depending on the sources, we are the poorest city in the country. We have the highest child poverty rate. Um, Despite all these anti-poverty initiatives, the poverty rate has increased year after year the the past five years. And poverty is not kingdom. Poverty is not kingdom. Uh, I'm going to talk about poverty, not, not today, but you can link poverty to sin. Fatherlessness, addiction. Um, poverty, I believe, is actually produced or birthed out of sin in, in sinful acts. Now, that's not to say that, that you can point at every individual and say they are in poverty because of, because of sin. But sin produces poverty. You look across the world. You know, people in third world countries who are starving, it is not because there is not food in the world available. It's because leadership or presidents or tribal leaders have given in to greed and selfishness and violence. Poverty can be directly linked to sin. We're going to talk more about that in the coming weeks. And we know that God speaks so much about Money, and I believe money is tied into worship. You know, we talk all the time about, about our lives being worship, our work being worship. Well, God wants us to worship with our finances, too. It's one of the reasons why we, have, we, we give we, we, tithes and, and, and offerings, because, and we do it in the midst of worship, because, because God wants us to worship even with our finances, Another reason why I want to talk about it is because when I talk about it, some people get offended. You ever get offended when people talk about money? You ever get offended when, I mean, I've been offended when certain, certain pastors or certain leaders have, have brought, up, brought up money and given, given their perspective. You know, offended or, you know, well, that's not, not, not just quite right. But, 
You know, if you're, I've been in that category, and if you're lumped in that, that category, it's another reason why I'm talking about it, because that should not be our response when, when a, a spiritual leader or pastor gets up and he talks about money. If it's in the Bible, we are responsible to talk about that, because the Bible, in the Bible there's truth. And, and there's truth about finances in Scripture that we need to talk about. And, and I believe in Matthew, in a couple other passages of Scripture, it identifies why people get offended when you talk about money. I'm going to read it. It's in Matthew 6.24. I think it's going to be up on the screen. If not, open up your Bibles. That's why you're supposed to bring them or your phone. Matthew 6.24 says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one, pay, pay attention to these words, either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted, or some versions say hold on to, the one and despise the other. So basically, whenever you talk about money, if, you talk, if we talk about money in church and you're offended, you're, this, this is why. Because you're devoted, you hold on to one, and you despise the other. So whenever someone talks about money in the church, or you know, whether it's here, here in the sanctuary or it's some, somewhere else, or you, you read a newspaper article about some ministry who's trying to get money to do, do some specific work, and you, you, know, you, you get offended, I believe this, this passage of Scripture identifies why. And then it says, you cannot serve both God and mammon. And that's the accurate word there. It's not money. Because money in itself is not mammon. It's saying that mammon can get on money. So from that passage of Scripture, you might be asking, so what's, what's mammon? Mammon is actually the name of a Syrian and Chaldean god. And you can link it back to, to Babylon, Babylon gods also. It's, a Greek, it's like the Greek god of, of wealth. I want to tell you what it is not, because, when, because you, can, you can demonize people who I think are gifted to make money, to acquire, to acquire wealth. Now, I think that they should be using that abundance for kingdom, kingdom purposes, but you can demonize money. Money is not mammon. Money is not bad. It's, it's neither bad or good. good. It, money is just a thing. You know, it's a, it's a piece of paper that people assign value to. So when you pick up a dollar, you're not going to get demon-possessed because you pick up a dollar or you pick up a $100 bill. Mammon is not that, or money is not that. Money is just a tool. There's no spiritual entity that's attached to quarters and nickels and dimes and dollars. None at all. Mammon is a demonic principality. I pray that, that, the, that the church would continue to grow in discernment over the spiritual realm. Because mammon is actually a demon or a principality that comes over the use of money. It's the value that's assigned to it. Money with a spirit attached to it becomes deceitful. I'm going to show you some really interesting passages where mammon has come into play. Mammon has gotten on money and caused people to do despicable things because they're, because they're deceived. So how does mammon operate? It causes one to desire wealth as the primary goal in life. I've been there. You know, I've, I still want to make money, but I remember when I was just consumed about making money. That, that not even that it, was a, that, it, that it was a sign of prosperity. I mean, at that point, it didn't even matter to me. I just knew that, that I needed money to survive, and I wanted a lot of it because I wanted to survive comfortably. You know, money, money or, or mammon can get on money and begin to deceive and, and, and can, can control your desires. It's a spirit that produces envy covetousness and jealousy you ever you ever hear about somebody winning something or like a lottery ticket or they get a raise in like you don't want to call it this but you get a little jealous you get a little envious or or you say you, you cover it up and say i'm really happy for them but i wish i got that raise you ever get that that's the spirit of mammon 
That's how it manifests itself in your life. It gets attached to your, your desires, your covetous and, and your envious desires, outwardly or secretly jealous of other people's success. And I would have to say that everybody in this room at some point in their life has been under the influence of mammon. If you've ever been jealous, if you've ever been envious, whether it was attached to money or not, I believe it's the spirit of mammon that can get on money. Being anxious about unmet needs is a sign that we worship mammon. You ever been in that place where, you know, it's, it's one of the, like, like Paul said, I've, I've learned how to, to abase. You're, you're abased, but you haven't learned how to abase well. Like there's, there's lack, and then you start to worry. You start to wring your hands. You're starting to worry about, you know, maybe you got laid off from, from work, or maybe you didn't get that promotion that you thought you were going to get, so you're not going to be able to buy the house that you need. And, you know, and then you, you, get, you get anxious, anxious you, get, you, you get frustrated. That's how mammon gets on money or really gets in us to control the way that we use money and view money. Because, again, money in itself has no control. But the spirit gets on mammon, and the spirit can control us. It causes you to withhold from others. I can say, now I know that there are exceptions to this, but I haven't, I've met with very few people who are struggling financially that give on a regular basis. They would say they don't give because they don't have to give. What I learned in my home is that you just give it off the top. You could, we're going to talk about tithe. We're not going to talk about tithe today. I know there's lots of different teachings and views on, on tithe. I'm going to share what mine is and what this, what this house is. I'm not going to push that on you. Right now we're going we're to talk about that later. But, you know, whatever you call it, Generally, people who have lack and consistent lack or in, 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 are, are, are struggling consistently financially, they have not learned the principle of sowing in giving. And, and that, would, that, that makes practical sense in some ways because if you don't have much, you really can't, you can't give it away because then you won't even have much, anything to meet your needs. But that's because the kingdom has not gotten in here. It hasn't gotten in here. We, we, we tend to trust money. We tend to trust things, our job, instead of trusting God. And when that happens, the spirit of mammon gets in us and gets in our thinking. Mammon is also the spirit that governs the three deadly sins. Remember, remember Eve, Adam and Eve gave in to the three deadly sins of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I wanted to find these for you. The lust of the flesh is desire... For everything that nourishes self, this, this includes sexual sins, gossip, physical violence, things like that. The spirit of mammon controls these, controls the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes is a strong appetite for what you see. It's like, you know, I want that. I wish I, wish I had that. It causes covetedness and jealousy. The pride of life, it's a desire for glory. It's a desire for attention. So it doesn't just manifest it and directly connect to money. It's more about your desires and how you view life and what you, what you deem as, as valuable. Here are some biblical examples of its power. You remember the story about Zacchaeus, the little guy? If you ever seen the movie, The Little Guy That Climbs the Tree to See, to see Jesus? He was, a, he was a tax collector. And tax collectors weren't liked by anybody. They might have not even been liked by their own family, except they brought a lot of money into the, into the family. So maybe the family did like them, but, but he, was, he, he was Jewish, and the Jews didn't like him because he was a tax collector, because they, tend, they, they tended to be dishonest and, and deceitful. But something compelled Zacchaeus to climb this tree, because he heard about Jesus. He probably heard about his miracles and freedom, and there was just something that attracted Zacchaeus to, to Jesus. And in Luke 19, uh, 2 through 10, I'm not going to read the, the whole story. You can read it on your own. It says Jesus entered Jericho, and he was, he was passing through, and a man was there named Zacchaeus, and he climbed a tree. Um, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your home today. 
So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Look at how fast this happens. This is amazing. The story's amazing. It's like, there's not a lot of deliberating. It's like something just clicked just because Jesus was in Zacchaeus' presence. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter because they knew who Zacchaeus was. He has gone to the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here, now I have half my possessions. Now I will give half my possessions to the poor. And, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay it back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. By, just by Zacchaeus being in Jesus' presence, because what, what Zacchaeus saw on Jesus was the favor of God. He wanted that favor. He desired that favor. There was, there, was, there was freedom in release that he saw in Jesus. And Jesus looked up and he greeted him. Zacchaeus was controlled by the spirit of mammon. He wanted money. He desired money and he was going to get it any way that he could. And he decided to be something that, that his own culture and people looked down on to gain, that, to gain that money. And it controlled him and it blinded him until he was in the presence of Jesus and he was freed from that spirit of mammon. Judas, you know the story about Judas. You know, first he gets ticked off because Mary is washing Jesus' feet with that expensive perfume, remember? Interestingly enough, Judas was the treasurer in the group, probably somewhat self-appointed. Um, made himself the treasurer, and he, he eventually sells out Jesus and is so ridden with guilt. Instead of ridden, instead of, because I believe God was there, and God would have forgiven Judas, but because he was so deceived by the spirit of mammon and his lust for money and position and power, Jesus was not what he expected. He wanted a military leader. He wanted, he wanted, he wanted a commander that was going to lead, lead the Jewish people in a revolt to free them. I mean, this is what he wanted. He wanted power. He wanted position. He wanted money. So blinded by it, it ended up killing him. I believe the spirit of mammon gets into people after they, after they lose all their money or they lose an inheritance, and often they end up killing themselves. I think, it's a, I think the spirit of mammon is attached to some suicidal spirit. And then we know the story about Ananias and Sapphira. You know, in the Acts, remember, they were, they were sharing all their possessions and land, and they were bringing money, and they were putting it at the disciples' feet to distribute to the poor. And Ananias and Sapphira, they held something back. In and of itself, I mean, they were used to tithing. Maybe they gave 10%. But in their hearts, they were holding back from God. And it was, it was, it was such a terrible thing. And I think there was some wickedness in there that, that we can't even identify. Because sometimes I read that story and I'm thinking, that seems to be a little extreme. They held, they held a little money back. Maybe, maybe I, I was that way because I've, I've like... I felt like I've held back, and I don't want God to do that to me. But I believe the spirit of mammon got on Ananias and Sapphira, caused them to not only deceive, deceive the disciples, those that they were giving it to, but, but they lied to the Holy Spirit. It says right there, Then Peter said to Ananias, How is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? You know, I think they were, being, they were being deceitful. They were all about dishonest gain, and God, it, through his Holy Spirit, was exposing Ananias and, and, and Sapphira. It doesn't give all the details, but I have to believe it was something pretty bad. And, and this spirit of mammon got on them and so deceived them that, that, that God had to take them out of the picture so as not to contaminate these other new, new believers. Back to Matthew 6.24. No one can serve two masters. There's two masters that are identified in this passage of Scripture that you can, you can serve. Either you will hate the one, the spirit of mammon, either you will hate the one and you will love the other, or you will be devoted or hold on to the one and you will despise the other. 
That's not a pretty picture to me. I remember when Bill Johnson was explaining to this, he, I can't remember what the other thing was that, that represented the spirit of manna, but the thing that represented the spirit of God was, was an iPad. You know, so <laughs> he said it was, it was the closest thing that I could get to godly. And then he, then he repented. But so I don't have anything. I don't have anything like that. But, what, but the, the, the point that he was making is that you're going you're gonna to serve one or you're going to serve the other. And if you decide that you're going to serve the spirit of mammon in your life, then you will despise the things of God. Not only will you despise God's people and pastors and teachers that talk about money and finances, you'll, you'll, you'll actually despise God because God wants you to be generous. God wants you to be giving because it benefits you and it benefits everyone else. One will be your master, and it's our choice which one is going to be our master. You choose by the way you feel about it, and it determines how you use it. You know, when you, when you think about your finances, and you think about money, and you think about your bank account, and you think about your investments, what do you think about when you think about those things? Do you think about how can I use those to bless how can I use those for kingdom purposes? Or do you, you know what I'm talking about. There's certain things that consume our thinking, consume our time. If, if money is one of those things that consumes your thinking, that you're constantly worried about, you're constantly checking your investments, you're constantly trying to figure out how you can make more money to stay, save, or, you know, to be there. And I'm not saying that stuff is not important. I'm not saying that retirement is not important. But if I think you know what I'm talking about. If it's something that consumes your thoughts and you're, you're, you're worried about it or you're anxious about it or, or that's, that's what you meditate on and you buy magazines, you buy financial magazines and books and you know, all those other things or the opposite, you don't care about it. You're, you're not responsible with money. You don't save. You don't invest. I mean, you, it, the spirit of mammon gets on both, both people who live in poverty and the wealthy. It's indiscriminate. It's the view that you put on it. If you have a view that money is evil, all money is evil, spirit of mammon can get on you because money is an evil. It's the way that you look at money. There are some people who, who are poor and they don't have financial means and they look at people who are wealthy and they demonize them. They're, they're jealous or they covet. Or, well, they just, they just, you know, they were born into a wealthy family or they had privilege. And, and, you know, I didn't get that privilege, so, you know, that's why I don't have any, any money. And they start to view money, and people like that as evil. That's the spirit of mammon, too. It's interesting, in, in Jesus' day, remember when Jesus turned over the money, the money changers' tables? You know the real reason why he did this? Think about the coins that were distributed during that day. Now, there was, there was like, temple money. There was Jewish money. But most of the money or currency that was exchanged was Roman money. What were on those coins? Caesar's face. One of the Caesar's faces. The Jews believed that was a graven image. That was an idol because Caesars wanted to be worshipped as gods. So, but they knew they needed it. Not, well, they thought that they needed it to be wealthy and they were actually, these money changers were actually exchanging this Roman money for temple money because they, because they couldn't bring this Roman money into the temple. They could bring it to the outside of the temples, and the money changers would change it for temple currency. But they were swindling the people because they knew that they couldn't bring the Roman money in. So they might say, give me your $20, and I'll give you $5 of temple money. That's why Jesus was upset with these money changers, and he turned over the tables. That, to me, is a picture of mammon. So depending on how you look at it, that money can become that. It could have the spirit of mammon on it, or it could have the spirit of God on it. It's one or the other. It's only one of two masters. So how do we defeat mammon? There's another parable. It's called the parable of the shrewd manager. To me, it is the most confusing, complicated parables. It's just, 
I'm going to read it. And, and there's something I want us to, to, to glean from it, but it's one of those parables you just got to, like, spend a lot of time with to, to really understand. But it's, it's the parable of the shrewd manager. I'm going to read it. It's in, uh, it's in Luke 16. So Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be a manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what, what I'll, I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of the master's debtors, and he asked first, how much do you owe your master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it out for 450 so he's given this guy a break, right? Great manager, or not. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, wheat he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. Not a thousand, but 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. I have a feeling, I mean, neither of these two in the picture are, are probably very good people. So it's like they're, they're, both, they're both deceived. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. This is what Jesus said. Whomever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. The same passage that I read earlier. This is just a retelling, the, the, the expounded version. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others. Again, this is what mammon does. It causes you to justify your actions in front of others. But God knows your hearts. What people value is highly detestable in God's sight. This passage of Scripture talks about true riches. Well, first of all, it talks about a manager and the, and the owner, and they're not, they're not great people. But, God, but Jesus has the ability to draw some incredible points out of a really complicated story. But he's basically talking about the spirit of mammon that got, that got on the manager and, I believe, the owner of the company. It's like he's going to be let go because he's not a good manager. It doesn't say that the owner knows that the guy is, like, like deceitful. I mean, he's, I mean, if I owned the company and knew the manager was given these kind of breaks and these people owed money, I would fire him too. But I don't think the manager or, or the owner of the company knew this. But, but Jesus', Jesus point was, you're not going to gain any, anything by being dishonest. And he says to pursue true riches. And I believe true riches are perfectly pictured when Jesus was feeding the 5,000. He's saying, who's got food? Nobody really had food. Nobody believed that Jesus gonna, is going to be able to feed 5,000 people, where's that food going to come from? Some little boy comes up with his few loaves and fishes, and, and Jesus, or he asked them to, to distribute them, and there was enough for 5,000 actually plus people. To me, that's what true riches are. It's the ability to access heavenly resources. We have got to stop thinking about money and worldly resources as the thing that we can gain our security from. We have got to see that as a tool that God uses to access heavenly riches. I, have, I mean, you have probably heard multiple testimonies of people who did not have financial means or resources, but they believed God and they trusted God, and somehow he multiplied things. He changed things. He put a money tree in the backyard. I mean, some of you, how many can pers personally testify of that? 
you know, I trust God. I trust God with my finances and with, with my life. And, and there was lack, and I just put it before the God. God, I didn't worry. I wasn't anxious. And I said, God, I believe you. God, I trust you. And, and somehow he made it work out. That's the God we serve. That's, that's, that's how to access heavenly riches, to put your trust in the spirit of God and not the spirit of mammon. <clears throat> In this specific case, we are to be generous with our wealth and use it for the benefit of others. Rick Joyner asked this question. This was phenomenal. He asked this question about or handling earthly finances. He said, the Lord made it clear that the way we handle our earthly finances will determine the kind of true riches of the kingdom that, that we can be trusted with. Consider this question. This is the question that he asked. Would you rather have money to buy enough food to feed 5,000 people or the power to multiply a single lunch into enough of them all? If you would rather have the money, then make it your primary pursuit. If you would rather have the authority that the Lord demonstrated when he walked on the earth, then pursue him. You will not have the perspective, a good perspective, a healthy perspective on money if you are pursuing money, if you are pursuing financial gain. Anybody, anybody who's a believer and kingdom-minded that is doing well financially and is someone who is probably generous, who gives, he's benevolent because they understand that God is their source. <laughs> I think it might have been Bill Johnson. I can't remember who said it. I listened to so many different people, but it was powerful. You know, he's, he said, I'm going to forget the exact, exact quote. Um, Actually, that'll totally ruin my message for next week, so you're just going to have to wait. <laughs> I'll, share, I'll share it next week. But this is, that's an important question. I think that we should all ask her, ourselves that question. What do we want to be rich and wealthy in? You know, for, for me, me personally, there are, there are, listen, it ebbs and flows. I can't say that I'm never concerned about money. And I'm never concerned about my finances. But for the most part, I'm not. I, have, I believe that, that I have been blessed financially, whether I was in this house, whether as a pastor, or whether I was working construction full-time. I was blessed because I understood that God was my source. I remember when God released me from fear and anxiety over finances. When I first started my business, uh, we, Charlotte and I were first married, I was in my early 20s. Um, I think we had, we had Stefan at the time, and I was, it, it was a new business, and I remember being constantly anxious and in fear where the next job was coming from. When you're, when you're self-employed, you, you folks who are employed, you have a 9-to-5 job and you have somebody, don't despise that. You know, I think sometimes you look at people who are self-employed, oh, man, they could, they could they make their own schedule. They could go bowling in the afternoon and... You know, that's fine. They could take a three-hour lunch break. Yeah, try being self-employed. People who are self-employed, honestly, are a little bit crazy. They're a little bit crazy. It's a lot of work to be self-employed. Because when you don't work, you don't make money. And you got to provide your own benefits. And, like, this was all on me. And it's like, God, I can't live like this. I can't live like this. And I would even, like, I'm giving, you know, I'm giving offering, I'm giving tithes. What's up, uh, what's up with this? This is just, I can't live like this. I said, God, you are my source. Even though I don't feel like that right now, I don't feel like that you're providing, I know that you are my source. I trust you. Take this fear and anxiety from me. This is ungodly. I wouldn't have identified it at the time as a spirit of mammon, but it was a spirit of mammon that was bringing fear and anxiety in my life. And I said, release me from this. I remember waking up in the morning, and it was gone. It was gone, and I never looked back. I've never had that sort of fear and anxiety. Have I had concern? Have I thought about it? Yes, but I never have had that fear and anxiety again because I trust God as my source. If you have issues with money, giving money, and you start making all sorts of excuses, well, I don't believe in the tithe. It's a law, you know, blah, blah, blah. We're going to talk about that. But either way, if you come up with excuses, it means that you are being controlled by the spirit of mammon. And it's, and it's not going to just attach itself to you over money. 
It's going to start and get in your life, and you're going to see lack wherever you are. You're going to see poverty in your life. You're going to have a poverty mentality. You're not going to live in abundance. And that, that's restrictive. That's restrictive. It caused you to question God, caused you to, to, to question your relationship, your identity with Christ. I don't want that. I don't want that for you. But if you don't want that, you've got to trust God. In this area of finance, you've got to trust God in this area of finance. You've got to trust God in this area of health. You know, do we get sick? Yes, we get sick. Do we have financial crisis? Yes, we do. But it should not strike us with fear and anxiety and worry. That is not godly. Those things are not godly. That is when spirit of mammon gets in and begins to work in your thoughts and, and starts to control your emotions. And then you start doing really stupid things like not trusting God. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. You know these passages as well. Now that I speak from want, for I have learned... <laughs> my dad read this passage this morning. I'm like, well, they're going to hear it twice. Evidently, they need to hear it twice. Now that I speak from want, for I have... This is Paul probably in jail. For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and the secret of going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I heard once, our main goal should not be to raise our standard of living, but to raise our standard of giving. Our main goal in life should not be to raise our standard of living, but to raise our standard of giving. You can get by on the world's ways and do well. You can't. But you meet someone who's doing well financially and is not generous, they're miserable. Because wealth has not fulfilled them. It has not made them happy. Again, I'm not demonizing money. But I am talking about the way that we look at it and the way we view it and what we're trusting. Trusting in God or are, are we trusting the spirit of mammon? If we set our eyes on, Lord, I want to just give. I want to give of myself in worship. I want to give of myself when I praise you. I want to be generous with my time with people in, in my love and relationships. I want to be generous with, with my finances. I want to raise my standard of giving. And I will tell you, I do more than tithe. I think that's a great benchmark, but I think it's a benchmark. I actually think the tithe is just a starting point. Most of the people that I know who have faithfully tithed and don't have an issue with it don't just tithe. They're always giving. And guess what I look at in their lives? While they, life ebbs and flows and sometimes there's lack, for the most part, they seem very financially secure and very happy because they don't stop. When you, when you think... If you've just made that a law, tithe, 10%, I'm going to make that a law and that's all I'm going to give him. You're restricting God and you're restricting the blessing on his life. And God loves a cheerful giver and you're not giving it cheerfully because you've made it a law. You've made it some law. It's okay, I got to give my 10%. I got I got to give my 10% and you grumble about it. But if you if you give that 10% and you're excited about it and cheerful, I guarantee you won't stop there. I do that. I can, I can honestly say that I do that and, and plus. You know, I give to other ministries and I give to people because I know God is generous to me. He controls my finances. Basically, I could tell you, I could tell you this. This is what I was going to share next week. Some people view tithe just as a rent payment. A rent payment. Tithe is just like, it's like your lease for what God gives you, because it's all his. You know, people grumble about the tithe. None of it's yours. From a godly perspective, none of it's yours. He's given it to us to steward and to manage, but everything is his. So if you get stuck on whether it's law or not, just consider it, consider it a rent payment. It's just a rent payment. <clears throat> I'm going to have the ushers get ready. I'm going to close in service. Um, last week, we forgot to take the missions offering. And just so you know, 
Every penny that comes in for missions goes out to management. We don't charge them a management fee. We send that out. As a matter of fact, if ever we run short, and we have a pretty significant monthly, monthly missions budget, and you'll know that when you come to the meeting, meeting next week. Even when we run short, we still send that out because we've committed to those ministries in, in, in those folks. And sometimes we run short, but we trust God. You know, we, we got we to step out in faith here, too, you know, in our finances. We have, we have commitments. We've committed to people in prayer, and we've committed to people in finances. So we're going we're gonna to send that money. So I accidentally forgot about that, but I thought, this is perfect. Because I believe that, I, can, can I ask you all to stand? I'm going to use this offering that we give to missions as a declaration that we desire individually, personally, not to be controlled by the spirit of mammon. Anybody want to be controlled by the spirit of mammon in here? Raise your hand. I'm going to have the intercessors run to you and pray for you. Yeah, nobody's raising their hand. So everyone can say this prayer. We don't want to be controlled by the spirit of mammon. I want you to, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. I'm going to start it out, and then I'm going to say, repeat after me. And then as a, as a declaration, as a statement, that I am no longer going to be controlled by the spirit of mammon. You don't have to commit to anything else, but you can commit to that. I'm not going to be controlled by the spirit of mammon. Lord, I'm going to be controlled by you in your direction for my life. I'm going to begin to invest in a relationship with you so you can guide me and direct me in every way in my finances. That's what this declaration is about. And, and if you believe it, I want you to come up, and if you have a quarter, a nickel, whatever, you just be led by the Holy Spirit. I want you to put it in there as a declaration that you're no longer going to be controlled by the spirit of mammon, and we're going to give all this money to the mission field. And we, we support some great missionaries, incredible missionaries. Um, May is our mission month, and, and you'll get to hear from some of them. Or you can go online and look at who we support. But it's, it's going to a worthy cause. But this is a declaration saying that I will not be controlled by the spirit of mammon. So don't pray this. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the, your, your truth. There's nothing that the word of God does not address, whether it's specifically or generally. It is, it is, it is food for life. It shows us how to live a successful life. It shows us how to draw into a relationship with you. It shows us how to trust you. And not only the word, it introduces us to a relationship, a living relationship, not with a book or an idea or a philosophy, but the living God. Through what the power of Jesus Christ did on the cross and the Holy Spirit that we get because he ascended and he said, I'm giving you this gift. I'm giving you the Spirit of God that, that can live in you, to, that, that, that can show you uh, how to live a righteous life. And we thank you for that. So repeat these words after me. Lord, I confess that I have not always managed my resources and managed my money well. I do not want to be controlled by the manipulating and deceiving spirit of mammon. But I submit my flesh, my eyes, my life to the control of the Holy Spirit. When there is lack in my life, I will not worry or be anxious, but with prayer, I will make my request known and I will place my trust in you, my heavenly Father, who provides and cares for me. When there is abundance, I will ask you how to use the blessing to bless others. But in all states, whether abased or abounding, I will honor you and be generous like you are. I submit my finances to your control. Show me how to use it to expand your kingdom and be a blessing to others. And this is God's answer to you. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Amen? God.